Okay, so um, Josh, in talking about some positive words associated with the wilderness, you used words like openness and opportunity. So that stands really in marked contrast to words like sparse and barren. Uh, anybody else want to say anything positive about a wilderness? Marilyn? I love the desert. Uh, it's so beautiful when the desert flowers and people seem to have warm, sunny personalities. It's, it's beautiful. Right. When you think about places where people retire, like Scottsdale, Arizona, right? <laughs> you know, places Tucson, <laughs> Tucson. You know, places of yeah. desert. Mm -hmm. we, they're not moving there because it's a barren, desolate place. I mean, they're not going for the negative aspects of desert. They're going for positive. So maybe it is Dafka very fitting that Matan Torah, the revelation of the Torah at Sinai, happened Dafka in the desert. Uh, a few years ago, in the uh, I think it was called the Jewish Journal, uh, there was an article entitled Parshat. Bamidbar, The Wilderness Speaks. And for some reason, I don't see an author's name on it, or I would attribute it. But um, he writes, um, he looks at the word midbar and changes the vowels. And if you have the very same Hebrew letters midbar and switch it uh, to the vowels, switch the vowels a bit, you have the word midaber, which means speaks. And he makes this point that the wilderness speaks to us. And he mentions in particular three aspects about the wilderness that are really significant. One is that the wilderness teaches humility because in the desert, he writes, it's hard to maintain the illusion that we are the center of the universe. Vast expanses of open land exquisitely carved by millennia of wind and weather stretch out in all directions. So it's very hard to look at that and say, oh, I created all of this. When you look at gigantic night skies with stars galore, it, it should give you a sense of awe and of God being the creator. So he talks about the wilderness, number one, teaching humility. Um, he also talks about the wilderness teaching gratitude because it's in contrast to the comfort of our homes, in the wilderness, it's easy to take things for granted, but in the wilderness, when we bar, you learn to notice and count your blessings. And then thirdly, uh, there's the idea that the wilderness teaches courage, that when you set out into the desert, that is an act of bravery. And our tradition teaches that the majority of B'nai Israel actually wanted to stay back in Egypt in slavery rather than face the uncertainty of the journey. So as you said, Josh, there's openness out there in the desert, but with that is also with openness comes uncertainty. So uh, the just wanted to end on speaking about the Midbar. He writes about it in general in the context of Parshat Bemidbar, the book of Bemidbar, but I think also his point is very applicable to the idea of Torah being given in the desert. He writes, I could almost hear the Midbar speaking to me. I wondered at its austere beauty and felt thankful. Most of all, I felt a surge of pride to count among my ancestors, those who had the chutzpah to walk through this wild place, who taught me through their example that the world expands in proportion to our own courage. Hamidbar midzaber, the wilderness still speaks to us, whispering its timeless wisdom as it taught our ancestors long ago. So I thought that was a really nice take on the wilderness and kind of a good way of us paying homage to the weekly Torah portion, Parshat Bamidbar, although we're actually going to go back now to the book of Shemot, to Exodus chapter 19, and look at, read, discuss the description of Matan Torah. So we're not going to look at the Ten Commandments themselves. We're going to look at the chapter preceding the Ten Commandments and what that context was. Uh, so does everybody have a text that they can bring up in front of them? Exodus 19? No. I'm seeing some nods. Okay, so if I have to put something up on the screen, then I'm not going to see all your faces, but I will do what I can here. So give me a moment. I will share the screen. Okay, can you see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is from Safari. Yeah. Okay, Safari. So, uh, will someone read for us uh, in the English? You could use this English or the English that you have in front of you. Uh, who would like to read? I can't. Now, of course, I can't see who's raising their hand. <laughs> Elaine, go ahead. 
On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone forth from the land of Egypt, on that very day, they entered the wilderness of Sinai. Keep going. Oh, having journey, journeyed from Rephidim, they entered the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. Israel encamped there in front of the mountain. Okay, and there's that word, will, it's translated here as wilderness. Sometimes in other translations, you'll read desert. But here's that word, midbar. And here it says, ba midbar, right? Because ba midbar, it's the desert. We know we're talking about the Sinai desert. But in the beginning of the book of Bimidbar, it doesn't, it, we haven't yet been introduced to the fact that we're in midbar Sinai. Okay, so keep going, Elaine. Verse three. And Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now then, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine. But you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. Moses came and summoned the elders of the people and put before them all that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered as one saying, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the people's words to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. Then Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and warn them to stay pure today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. You shall set bounds for the people round about saying, beware of going up the mountain or touching the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be either stoned or shot. Beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up on the mountain. Moses came down from the mountain to the people and warned the people to stay pure, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Moses led the people out of the camp uh, toward God. Uh, read right here um, on the third day. On the third day, on the third day <laughs> as morning dawned, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain and a very loud blast of the horn. And all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses led the people out of the camp toward God and they took their places at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke for the Lord had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. A little higher. The blast of the horn grew louder and louder. As Moses spoke, God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the, to the, top of the mountain, and Moses went up. The Lord said to Moses, go down, warn the people not to break through to the Lord to gaze, lest many of them perish. The priests also who come near the Lord must stay pure, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us saying, set bounds about the mountain and sanctify it. So the Lord said to him, go down and come back together with Aaron, but let not the priests or the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. And Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. God spoke all these words saying. Okay, and then we end up with the first, that's the beginning of the Ten Commandments, begins with the word Anochi, Anochi Hashem Elohecha, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, the house of bondage, etc. Okay, so uh, this story of Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, Describe to me in your own words, what did it look like? What did it sound like? What did it feel like? If you were there and you had to describe it to somebody, what words would you use? Thunder. Thunder, yeah. We have a whole like sound and light show going on there, right? Some of you went to that sound and light show in Jerusalem. This must have been even more than that, right? Ruth, go ahead. 
I should think there was fear among the people because it sounded so ominous. Yes, there's a lot of, you know, beware, don't do this, do this. They're trembling, right? This real idea of trembling could mean that you're looking forward to something, but there's a fear factor in there as well. Yes. Um, anything else, um, Marilyn? I would think there would be hope things would get better. Okay. So better compared to slavery or better compared slavery. to slavery? Yeah. I mean, we'd hope, but, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of people who actually wanted to stay in, <laughs> stay in Egypt and be slaves because better the certain slavery that they knew than the uncertain wilderness. That's and the relationship that was in front of them with God uh, and the rules exactly that right. all of that. Uh, okay, so there's a nice description. There's a lot of, it sounds like I'm thinking Moshe might have been really tired going up and down that mountain, right? It doesn't <laughs> sound like he just went up and then God spoke to him and then boom, 10 commandments. That's how it happens in the movies. But here he you- He was in better shape than that. the rest of us. He was in better <laughs> shape than the rest of us, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a smaller uh, mountain. <laughs> Right. So uh, I, I, wanna share, I do want to share with you uh, some uh, Talmud pieces. This is a class on its Torah tidbits, but also with Talmud tidbits as well. And the piece of Talmud that I'm going to show you is from the book. Of, it's, uh, it's based on a verse in Shemot in Exodus chapter 19, verse 17. And the piece of Talmud we're going to look at, it's a Masechet Shabbat, the tractate that's known as Shabbat, uh, Daf 88 Amud Aleph. So Shabbat 88a. So first, let me just go back to what Elaine read before. Let's go back to Exodus 19. And it's Exodus 1917. This is the verse we're talking about. Okay, so the, Elaine read the translation here, it said they took their places at the foot of the mountain. In Hebrew, it's Vayityatsvu betachtit hahar. And the wording betachtit hahar is considered to be unusual. It's not a typical way of saying at the foot of the mountain. And that is what really begs for commentary here. Uh, and it's understood in a different way because what is the word tachtit comes from? It comes from the word tachat. Tachat is actually the uh, the word that you use for tush, like tuchas, like your bottom, right? So tachat, tachtonim are underwear. So tachat actually, if we connected to that root, it should be something more like under, which is really strange. They took their places under the mountain, uh, which is why this translation goes in this direction of taking place at the foot of the mountain. So uh, let me share with you now. Um, okay, so first. All right, that didn't work. I'll try again. One more time. Here we go. Okay, so again, that verse, that verse, uh, oops, where is it? Right, so here's the word I was talking about. Okay, and now we're going to look at the Talmud, Shabbat, Hechet Amud Aleph, which is Shabbat 80A, 88A. It starts with a quote, this quote from the Torah, uh, and I'll read in Hebrew, uh, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Rabbi Abdimi Bar Chama Bar Chasa said, the Israelite people actually stood beneath the mountain. Okay, in Hebrew, it's here. Milamed she kipah kadosh baruch hu alehem et ahar kigigit veamar lahem imatem mekablim haTorah mutav veimlav sham teha kivuratchem. Let me translate. So Rav Abdimi, the son of Chama, the son of Chasa, says that God actually took the mountain, took Martin Har Sinai, and held it like a kipah, a kipah haKadosh baruch hu. God as like a cover. God put a cover of kipah uh, baruch hu kigigit. Okay, and the way it's translated here in this uh, Safari translation is, God covered the Israelites with the mountain as though it were an upturned vat and said to them, if you accept the Torah, great, excellent. But if not, there will be your burial. So that's, you know, very uh, interesting commentary, right? And Rav Acha Bar Yaakov says, 
from here, there is a substantial caveat to the obligation to fulfill the Torah. The Israelite people can claim that they were coerced into accepting the Torah and it is therefore not binding. Right. So uh, that in and of itself is controversial. But let, let's go back to this image of this upturned vat. I'm sure when most of you think of Matan Torah, when you think about the giving of the Torah, you're imagining, especially after reading the biblical text, you're imagining Moshe going up and down, Moshe at the top of the mountain, the people kind of gathered around. I don't know, maybe if there is a lot of fear there, maybe they have one foot in, one foot out. They have one toe away from the mountain, one foot. But we certainly would not be picturing this idea of a mountain like a, a, a kippah, like a gigit, like this upturned vat on top of B'nai Israel, because that seems that maybe there wasn't free will, and that then makes it a little more problematic. So uh, to receive the Torah, it's one thing to say, oh, now seven ishma, B'nai Israel said we will do when we will listen. That shows that they were un unconditionally wanting to enter into this relationship with Hashem. But this other image that's in Masechet Shabbat in the Talmud seems to give us a very different idea, a very different concept. And that's the concept that they didn't really have a choice, that it was, hey, you better accept this Torah or else. So any comments on this piece of Talmud? Uh, and, or even on the idea of whether or not it makes a difference uh, that the Torah was accepted willingly or if it was more of a well, no choice in the matter kind of situation. Yeah, no, it's a great, que it's a great question. My, um, um, in listening to this, it, it reminded me of, uh, of a very interesting work that was written by, um, by, uh, by Rabbi uh, David Weiss Halivni years ago. Um, entitled Holy Writ, in which in which he he made the interesting argument that that while the Torah was given at Sinai, it wasn't received at Sinai, huh. that it really wasn't received un, until the, the the time of uh, uh, until the time of Ezra, if my recollection is correct, and uh, it, it does sort of underscore the fact that uh, that you know. We, we immediately think that if one is given something that that the other one that 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 the other one takes it but uh the fact that one he was arguing the fact that it was given didn't mean that the that 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 the people were ready to receive it and that it took some time before before they warmed up to the idea and that was a combination of both the you know the 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 novelty the novelty of it, the fear of being introduced to things that are new, which is, you know, just part of our nature. We don't accept things readily that are altogether new to us. Right. Right. So it, it, it would seem to make it, it would seem to make sense. At least it makes for a plausible argument, whether that's really the case or not. I don't know. But it makes for at least in my judgment for a plausible way of looking at it. OK, so um, I see. Let's thank you for those comments, Josh. I see Bobby has uh, some type of artwork here uh, about the giving of the Torah. And we definitely have a very awe inspiring event. We see the lightning. We can't hear the thunder, but we can imagine that sound and look at where the people are. Right. So is this I don't know if we can tell from this um, from this drawing or I don't know if is it a drawing or a painting. I can't see from here or. I think it was an etching originally. An etching. All right. So we can clearly see the people and we don't see any representation of like a hand of God. It's very hard to represent that in a pictorial form without being too anthropomorphic. Uh, but uh -huh. um, do you do you have one with the hand of God in that same in that yeah. same book? This is from the Passover Haggadah of Saul Riskin mm -hmm. from the 19, I just saw the hand. Ah. I always like this drawing too, very much so. Oh, there's a hand here. Ah, okay. So this actually, so boy, there we're having a, a anthropomorphism writ large. Uh, we thought, <laughs> but apparently, the uh, the etcher, the artist, did not choose to depict this midrash that is cited in the Talmud in Masechet Shabbat because the hand does not have the mountain in it, right? We still have, it's God's hand above Moshe. Moshe seems to be on the mountain and the people seem to be at the foot of the mountain in the way we generally, uh, you know, think about that idiom of Tachtit Hahar being at the foot of the mountain. Thanks for sharing that, Bobby. What what book is that from? Did you say Riskin? Haggadah Shal Pesach? The Haggadah. Shaul Res 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 Reskin, okay, thank you. All right, so um, let's go back and look at some more Talmud because this Talmud that I shared with you is, 
I I said it's it's in my Sechet Shabbat, and that particular piece talks about God gives this idea of God holding a kippah, the the Har Sinai like a kippah on Bnei Israel. But later on in the same section of the Talmud, there is a very different story. It's a counter narrative. It's all the stuff that may, may be more familiar to us, which is all of these comments on the comment Naseh, we shall do. The fact that Bnei Israel said Naseh before hearing what the Ten Commandments were. They didn't first hear the deal and then say, okay, I agree, I'll sign the contract. They agreed to the terms of the contract, to the relationship before hearing the Ten Commandments. It's in Exodus 19, not in Exodus 20. So that gives a very different idea. That gives us the sense of free will. Uh, I wanted to move on to a different issue relating to Matan Torah, and that's the issue of gender. And May I ask a question, Rabbi? Yes. Was he going to bury them under the mountain? Was that was that? Um, no, it didn't say that anyone was buried under the mountain. It was more, the comment was more of a threat. It was no, but God saying to ben, to Bnei Israel. Do you want the Torah? Well, you better say yes, or else I'm going to drop this mountain on your head, and this is going to be your burial place instead of this, yeah, like, be, you know, the nice God needs to bury them under the mountain. Basically. Yes, right. Okay. So, like, how do you say no to that? Right. Of course, you're going to accept the commandments if that's what the the threat is. So, going back to this source sheet that I put together, I'll take you to another. Still addressing the issue of what happened at Mount Sinai, and we've seen some of you respond to it. We've seen the, some of the artwork that Bobby shared with us. We've seen his comments in the Talmud, and I'm going to go past this and go to my next text here. Okay, so um, this next text that I'm going to share is going to make the case that the women and the men heard the Torah differently. Okay, and it's based on this verse, Exodus 19, verse 3, that Elaine read earlier. Uh, and I, I added some Hebrew transliteration to it. So Elaine read, and Moses went up to God. Hashem called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel. When she read it and when we hear it in the pshat and the plain meaning of the text, we think of house of Jacob and children of Israel, Beit Yaakov and B'nai Israel as synonymous. It's just like two ways of referring to the same people. But there are some commentaries that actually view Beit Yaakov as referring to the men who were present. Uh, sorry, the other way around. That Beit Yaakov referred to the women who were present, and that Bnei Israel referred to the men who were present. In fact, some of you may be familiar with the girls' yeshiva known as Beis Yaakov, right? So sure. I refer here as Beit Yaakov. Beis Yaakov was formed and given that name because of the Midrash that I'm about to show you, this comment on this Torah portion that we can see um, in, on in, that is quoted by Rashi. So Rashi quotes, and he's actually basing it on Mechilta. Mechilta is a, uh, Mechilta de Rabbi Yishmael is a Midrash. And according to Rashi, he says, Beit Yaakov, Beis Yaakov, this denotes the women. To them you shall speak in gentle language. Tomar la elu hanashim, tomar la hen bilashon raka. So same words, but speaking in a different way. Uh, and then, okay, so that's from the Mechilta. But vatagad livnei Yisrael, and this is what you should say to bnei Yisrael. What does that mean? That means the men. Okay. So here, uh, did I translate it? Yes. Here. So Beit Yaakov, Beit Yaakov is the women, children of Israel, bnei Yisrael, the men. Uh, to Beit Yaakov, to the Beit Yaakov, to the women, speak gently, which means give that women the basic ideas. But when you're speaking to bnei Yisrael, the men. You should speak to them. And what does that mean? In detail. So gently to the women and in detail to the men. To me, those don't seem like opposites, right? It seems more like if it was gentle, it would be gently and harshly. Um, and if you wanted to have an opposite to in detail to the men, you'd have you know, kind of general terms to the women and just detail to the men. So what do you think about this commentary? What do you think it's trying to teach us? Why did the men and women have to be spoken to differently according to the Mechilta? Helen, do you want to unmute? Un un Maybe the, the women were able to grasp it 
uh, with the basic ideas, but you really had to flush it out for the men to understand it. <laughs> That's a nice feminist read on this, right? Because they're right. Now thank, I say, thank, I, thank you so much for that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so right, you had to man. God had to mansplain to the to the man. <laughs> Right. Sorry, Josh, you're outnumbered here. Uh, but it's funny because you know, I've always been outnumbered. It's okay. You've always been outnumbered in all kinds of ways. Uh, it's interesting. I should uh, correct what I said in terms of feminist reading. Feminist reading doesn't always mean pro women. Um, a feminist reading of the Torah would be stop pointing out the negative depictions of women in Torah and commentary, and a feminist would be pointing that out by saying, see, look at this patriarchal narrative and how it excludes us, and uh, we're not part of this, and it's like we were not at Sinai, it was we were, we were not part of this uh, covenant, this relationship, but Helen's way of understanding these very same words, another way of being a feminist read on it is to be more pro-women and to say, look, we can redeem the time. It may seem like this is an anti-woman type of commentary, but really it isn't. The men needed the detail. Uh, the women were able to get it just from from general. Uh, any other comments on this before we, we look well, at- I don't think that's problems. really what they meant. I think they meant that the women can't understand detail. Right. So the idea is, yeah, the, kind of, they don't really understand. They can't handle so much. So let's give the whole thing to the women, to, to the men, but the men, not so much. What about this idea of gently? You know, when you first start reading this, Lashon Raka, uh, speaking, speaking to the women gently, that to me sounds nice, right? Speaking to them in a gentle language, like that seems to me like a nice way to speak to everyone, not just to women. So what do you think the counterpart to that would be? Um, that they're talking, talking to them like children, like you would speak oh. to a child. Oh, I see. So you're looking at it. So a, ne a negative feminist read on this, right, would be, uh, yes, the women can't handle the harsh specifics. So let's just, let's, you know, give it to them, break it to them gently, as you say, as that comment is. All right, let, that says the Mechilta. Let's see what uh, Shmot Rabba has to say on it. So Shmot Rabba is another midrash, and again, this part that's in bold, Koto Mar Beit Yaakov, is the same verse from the Torah. It's this Exodus 19, verse 3. And again, just like the other midrash says, Eluhan Hashim, these are the women. Amarlo, and more lahem rashe devarim shehem yuchalot lishmoa. Uh, say to them the kind of head topics, the general topics that they are able to hear, maybe understand. Uh, then this quote from the Torah, Vatageh li Bnei Yisrael, and what you shall tell Bnei Yisrael, Elu Anashim, these are the men, and more lah, Amar lahem, Amar lah, Amar lo, and more lahem dituke devarim shehem yicholim lishmoa. So we understood this to mean things that they are able to understand, but lishmoa really means to hear, and I don't know if that makes this any difference. Um, but let me I'm going to go on to the English translation so you can follow with me. All right, can someone would someone like to read this? I just read this part. This was uh, the part I translated. Okay, but now there's another explanation, a davar acher. I always love the davar achers, that there's another way to read this. <laughs> right, so somebody else, Betty Ann, would you like to read? Sure. Another explanation. Why were the women given the Torah first? Since they hastened to observe a mitzvot. Another explanation, so they could lead their children to Torah. Rabbi Tehila the Kassarian of Caesarea said, the Gadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy Blessed One, said, when I created the world, I commanded only the first man, Adam, and after that, Chava was commanded and she transgressed and corrupted the world. Now, if I do not call to the woman first, they will nullify the Torah. So it says, so say to the house of Jacob, Okay, so what do we think about this? Let's take all. Let's take them one at a time. So the Devar Acher, this uh, idea of giving the women, it, it, it were. Let me backtrack. We were talking about different ways that it, that the Torah was given to the men and women. This midrash seems to go one step further and saying not just that it was given to them differently, but that they actually were given the Torah first. So that other midrash, the Nechilta midrash, on the first part of Shemot Rabbah is talking about simultaneous giving to men and women. But here we're going one step further and saying the women got the Torah first. And was that, how do we read that from a feminist lens? Is this anti-women? Is this pro-women? Uh, is it neutral? 
Okay, so this first one, since they hasten to observe the mitzvot, you know, is that, what does that say about the women? That's positive. Okay, so that's nice, right? We got to give them some first. They're chomping at the bit. They want the mitzvot, right? In that picture, that etching that Bobby shared with us earlier, I didn't take a look at the men versus the women, and I'm sure the person, the Raskin, who did the etching wasn't really separating gender in this kind of way. But who knows? Maybe there could be some painting or etching somewhere where they have the women in the front row, not because they were put there, but because they were so excited to get the Torah, and God spoke to them first. Okay, so there's another explanation. Uh, why the women first, that they could lead their children to Torah. You know, is that a positive representation of women? Negative, neutral, just another way of accounting for the women going first, according to this Midrash. Well, they, they're they the ones who teach the children. Right, but is that a good, is that saying something good about women or something yes. bad about women or yes. something neutral about women? I think it's good. But on the other hand, there was a little part in there that said that Eve was was the one to blame Right. So we're not there yet. That's why I'm taking them one at a time. Right. Okay. So oftentimes when we read Midrash, we look at it as a whole. And especially if you read the last piece and it seems negative, you walk away from it saying, ah, oh, this Midrash was so anti-women. I'm taking it apart a little bit to show that mm -hmm. there's lots of ways to present it. I mean, first of all, they didn't have to discuss gender at all. There was no read. There's nothing in the shot in the plain meaning of the text in Exodus 19 right. that mentions when men and women in in this part um, there is something in the shot of the text that where god says to moses tell the people not to go near a woman for three days right that whole don't don't go near the woman in preparation for matan torah and in that sense it seems like god is talking only to the men and that's i think really an anti-woman thing because it's saying the women weren't even there these midrashim are all much more pro-women in the sense that they not only have the women present, but here in this part of the Midrash, the women were given the Torah first. So these first two may seem positive. This third one, the one that Elaine's mentioning, so this one is not sounding so great because anytime you start blaming Chava, Chava for stuff, it's like it all falls on the women, right? And she transgressed, she corrupted the world, and you know, need, you know, I, I need to talk to, to the women because otherwise, uh, I have to call the women first because look what happened when you don't call the women first. We go back to the very first time where God spoke to people and God chose to speak to the man first, it was often vey for humanity. Perhaps if God had gone to Eve first, maybe things would have worked out better. Uh, so this time around, God wants to do it the right way and gives the Torah to uh, B'nai Yisrael first. So any comments on any of these midrashim? On the yeah, I, yeah I, I think when you when when we think of it in this light, you know, it, it, it sort of, it, it isn't, I, I think one could make the argument it, it it says it 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 says a, a, a number of things about men that aren't altogether favorable. You know how easily we can how easily we can be swayed. How easily we can be how easily we can be distracted. You know, I I think it speaks as much to the fr fr the the fragile nature of who men are as it as 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 it does anything with respect anything with respect to women, especially given the fact that 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 when we speak of knowledge especially in in using the hebrew language it's invariably spoken of in the in 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 the fem, in, in the feminine sense and 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 i've always i always found that to be to, to be interesting which is why i've always been comfortable being outnumbered um, <laughs> cuz i i told my i to, i told i told my son max years ago i said listen don't be fooled by the fact that there are two men and two, two males and two females in this house. Trust me, we're outnumbered. I know you're looking at, I know you don't get that, but when you get older, someday you're going to come back to me and you're going to tell me, you know, when you said that to me, now I get it. <laughs> Rabbi? <laughs> yes, go ahead. I, I think that this just, this uh, additional phrase just indicates even more that the feeling may have been from the first number one and two that women are more aggressive and that they will be first and take over first. And so men beware, just get the details and don't share as much to the women. Okay, and when you say that, um, are you saying it in a, as, in a negative way about women, positive or neutral? I, I, I'm taking it as a warning to men. 
Ah, okay. Yes, duly <laughs> noted. Do you take that negatively <laughs> or positively? I don't know. But it's not that women are so shy and retiring or couldn't learn. Right. I don't. I don't think that is that is definitely a negative, and I don't think that that from these inferences here are indicating that it is not so. It's the reverse. Hmm. Okay, very nice. Um, so I did want to point something out going back to the shot, the Exodus 19. Let me put it back on the screen here. Um, actually, I'm not going to do that. Um, let me just find it here. Um, bah, 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 bah. Um, right, so the part about the three days not coming near a woman. Uh, I misspoke mm. before. It wasn't God who issued that command. It was Moses' okay. reinterpretation okay. of God's command. Right. So God does say, uh, is that, uh, okay. um, so God talks in chapter 19, verse 11, uh, starting in verse uh, 10. God says to Moshe, go to the people and warn them to stay pure today and tomorrow let them wash their clothes, let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. And then in verse 12, God says, beware of going up the mountain or touching the border. Uh, whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Mm -hmm. you know, no mention of women. The only thing possibly alluding to women is when God is saying, warn them to stay pure. Maybe pure means not having sex for a couple of days, but even there it, it says, uh, today and tomorrow, it's just two days. And when Moshe interprets God's words in verse 14, when Moshe comes down from the mountain and warns the people to stay pure, he says, be ready for the third day, do not go near a woman. So Moshe is adding this of his own will. So this has something to say about God, about Moshe more than it does about God. Uh, I don't know if, what that has to do with any of our gender discussion, but I thought I would add that in there as the one piece in chapter 19 that does address uh, gender in some way. Yes, Ruth. Um, I guess you know by now that my mother was a feminist from the 1920s. But when I asked her why we have to sit in the balcony and why I can't sit down with my dad, she said, men are weak and they can't be near a woman without losing their concentration. Right. Which is what I said, which is what I said. That's earlier. what Josh was alluding to earlier. Right. So it's like their problem. So yeah, we got. <laughs> yeah, not ours. And, and by, and by, and by the way, there, women weren't the only feminists in the 1920s. There were men who were as well. Floyd yeah. Dell is, is, a, is, a, is a great example of that. Thanks for that. You got to stand up for your people, Josh. <laughs> no, ju ju it's, 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 just, it, it's, it's just about the historical record. It just, you know, there, there were men who were part, who, who were part of, who were part of. I think my grandfather was because um, he allowed my mother to do things that an Orthodox man wouldn't normally allow his daughter to do. <clears throat> Turn of the, you know, she was born in 02. Mm -hmm. So I think he was a feminist as well. Yeah, yeah. I always thought that. So the last thing I want to talk to, uh, two last points about Matan Torah, about the giving of the Torah. Uh, one is back to the issue of was it free will or did they, did the Israel enter into this covenant willingly or not only willingly, but eagerly. And many of you have heard famous jokes, which I'm not going to tell um, about the Ten Commandments, but it actually, the joke stems from the Midrash, also from Michil to the Rabbi Ishmael. So I'm going to share that with you as well. Okay, so I'm going to move on from this that we just, oh, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to read it and translate it. Okay. It was for this reason that um, the nations of the world were approached by God to receive the Torah first. So as not to give them uh, a mouth opening, a pretext uh, to be able to say to God, to the Shekhinah, if only you had asked us, if you had approached us with the Torah, we would have accepted it. That's what the nations of the world would say. So therefore, 
we know that God did approach the Umot Ha'olam, the nations of the world, and they did not accept it. Shene Amar, and then there's a quote in the Mechilta from a different part of the Torah, from uh, the book of Devarim, Lam and Gimel, uh, Pasuk Bet, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33, verse 2. Vayomer Hashem mi Sinai ba. Hashem came from Sinai. Okay, so now this is going to be the famous Midrash. V'niglaha al b'nei Esav harasha ve'omer lahem, mekablima temer ha-Torah. So the Shechina, God's presence, appeared to the children of Esav, the wicked Esav, and said to them, to these wicked children of Esav, the Edomites, do you want the Torah? And the Edomites said, Amrulo, ma ketivba? Well, it depends what's written in it. Amar lahem, so God says, lo tirzach. It says in the Ten Commandments, the sixth, the sixth commandment is lo tirzach, you shall not murder. Amru, so the descendants of Esav, the Edomites, what they said, Zohi Yerushasha Horishenu Avinu Shene Amar Al Charbacha Tichyev. We can't accept the Torah because that's our Yerusha, our uh, heritage. This is what we inherited from our father. Uh, and they quote from um, Bereshi twenty seven forty uh, Al Charbacha Tichyev, which is something that uh, Yitzchak, when he blesses Esav, this is what he says. So then, what does God do? God had gone to the Edomites, to the descendants of Esav, and now goes to the Ammonites. Nigla al bnei Ammon umoav, and also to the Moabites. Amar lahem mekablima temet haTorah. So God says to the Ammonites and to the Moabites, "Do you accept the Torah?" And Amrulo, they said, "Depends." Ma katuva? What does the Torah say? And God says, "Amar lahem lo tinaf." Well, lo tinaf is do not thou shall not commit adultery. That's that's written in the Torah. Amrulo. So these uh, children, the descendants of Ammon and Moab, the Ammonites and the Moabites said, Oi, no, kulanu miniuf. We all come from, miuf is uh, really not just talks about adultery, but also just uh, immoral sexual acts, uh, which adultery is one of them. Miuf also includes incest. And the quote here is from Bereshit Yud Tet Lamed Vav, Genesis chapter 19, verse 36. And this is right after the destruction of Sodom. It's in Parshat Vayera. And it says here uh, that the two Benot Lot, the, the daughters of Lot, they got pregnant from their fathers. Okay, so what does this have to do with anything? Um, does anyone remember who the daughters of Lot were and how they got pregnant by their father, Lot? And which clearly would be incest. Well, they it's, thought it was the end of the world. There was yeah. no one left. Yeah, they, they, they thought it was the end of the world. They thought there was nobody left. So they said, oh, we, we want the world to continue. We have to sleep with dad. So they each end up sleeping with dad. And the names of their kids, if we look at Parshat Vayera, the name of the kids are Amon and Moab. Yes. Moab comes from the word Av, which means father, like Abba, dad, right? So Av, Abba, uh, Moab, Me'av, from father. And Ammon and Moab were the original children. These are the children of Lot and each of his daughters, the older daughter and the younger daughter. And then their descendants are the Ammonites and the Moabites. So here, when God says to them, you want the Torah, and they say what's written in it, and God says, well, you can't do immoral sexual acts, and say, oh, count us out, because we actually stem from immoral sexual acts. We come from Neuf. We are the descendants of Ammon and Moab, and uh, we're the products of incest. So, third case, Nigla al Bnei Ishmael. So now the Shechina, divine presence, is now God shows the divine presence to the children of Ishmael, to the descendants of Ishmael. Amar lahem, mekablima temet ha-Torah. Do you accept the Torah? Amrulo, ma katuv ba. So again, they ask, well, what's written in it? They want to hear what's written in the Torah before they will agree, yes or no. Amar lahem, so God says to them, lo tignov. It says... Um, lo tignov means don't steal. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Amrulo, so Yishmael said, the children of Yishmael said, Bizo habracha nitbarech avinu. This is the very blessing with which our ancestor Yishmael was blessed. Going back to Bereshi Tetzayin Yudbet, Genesis 16, verse 12. Hu yihia para adam. Uh, he shall be a brutish man, a wild man. And uh, then it also says later on in Bereshi, man, ki ganov gunavti. This is Lavan, Lavan, who, uh, is that right? 
no, that's not right. Um, but this is talking about Yishmael, right? Uh, so you have these three people, three sets of people, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. Two, you have the descendants of Ammon and Moab. Three, you have the descendants of Yishmael. And all of them find a reason not to accept the Torah once they hear what's inside it, because there's at least one commandment that they find objectionable. So, Shabbat it's all Yisrael, but when the Shekhinah, when God comes to Bnei Yisrael, uh, what do they say? Mi mino esh dot lamo. This is the last chap, the last section, the last parsha of the book of Devarim. We read this on Simcha Torah, Vizot Bracha, uh, and it's mi mino esh dot lamo means in God's right hand, uh, the fire of the law is for them. And so when God came to Bnei Israel with this fi- in this fire and the cloud and all this, and with the thunder and the lightning, Pachu kulam pihem ve'amru, they all opened their mouths and they said, kol asher diber Hashem na'aseh v'nishma. They mm. didn't ask, unlike all these other guys who were saying, ma katuvba, what does the Torah say? And it depends, tell me what's in it, and then we'll decide whether or not we want to accept it. Here, Bnei Israel say, whatever God said, we will do and we will listen. We'll do even before we hear the terms of the deal. So uh, what are your thoughts? You've, have you heard this before or some version of this yeah. mid- joke form? Or uh... Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I, 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 I have in a couple of different forms. Just a couple of quick thoughts on it. One is that <clears throat> it's, I've always found it interesting, the, the, um, you know, the thoughts with regards to the Ammonites and the, and, and the Moabites, because one, one could conceivably a- ask the question, well, how could they have been morally liable for acts that preceded, that preceded the giving of the Torah? Hmm. How could they have been fully, how could they have been held accountable when they, one could argue they weren't fully informed moral beings, which would be true, would have been true for all of us prior to the giving, prior to the giving of the Torah. The same reason, for example, we could argue why wasn't Cain put to death for the killing of, uh, of, of Abel. But how could Cain have been a fully informed moral being since his act long predated the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the giving of the Torah? So I've always had a, 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 a question about, a, 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 about that aspect of it. There's also the question of the idea of acceptance. Because one, you know, there, there are certain things one accepts based on coercion versus other things that are based upon consent. And maybe that sort of delineates the timeline that, that in, in, in making the argument about the, uh, about the, uh, about the Jews not accept, not, not receiving the Torah at Sinai, but receiving it, but, but, but receiving it later when, when, when it was done in a more, in, in a more consensual fashion versus in the more, in, in, in the more, in, in the more, seemingly coercive way mm-hmm. interesting um one more i just wanted to go back to the, this is not a philosophical point it's more of a language point uh this midrash uh that we just read with the, god bringing the torah to all the different people and then bringing it to b'nai israel and the contrast between those three sets of people and b'nai israel uh very much shows free choice or t- to some extent free choice uh on behalf of b'nai israel whereas that first commentary we read from the Talmud from Masechet Shabbat has God putting Har Sinai, the mountain, like a kippah or, a, or an overturned vat, a gigit, on top of their heads and talk about coercion, complete coercion there. The word that's used there is kippah. The word kippah, as you know, is the same word that we use for head covering. And also, does anyone know how to say Iron Dome, the anti-missile technology in Israel? Oh. Right? It's actually called kipat barzel. No. So that same word kipa, it oh. appears in many different contexts, right? We hear the word kipa all the time in modern parlance. We're talking about oh, people having a kipa on their head, but a kipat barzel, the iron dome, are also it's because they are like a cover that goes on top of the missile and zaps it, uh, prevents it from hurting uh, people. So if you look at any Israeli newspaper over the last couple of days, there's been a lot of talk about the kipat barzel here. We got a picture. I like all of. Uh, Bobby's visual aids here. And if we can see it. That's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, These are friends of mine in Israel who are currently sitting in a shelter. So when you mentioned Iron Dome, I. Wow. 
Yes, uh, uh, my daughter uh, was at the Yom Yerushalayim parade yesterday, as were oh. you know many other people. Uh, actually, uh, An Andrew Stein, who's the younger son of Terry and Ira Stein, uh, was also at that parade. And uh, when the sirens went off and they all went into bomb shelters, uh, Eva, not Eva, Eva's home with me, Eva's in Manhattan. Um, Eva, uh, Rivka went into a bomb shelter under Mamilla. I don't know if any of you have heard of Mamilla is the mall that's attached to the old city. And when it was built, it was decided from the beginning that rather than having itsy bitsy bomb shelters all over the place that they would make the entire parking garage underground and that it would serve as a bomb shelter. So fortunately, I'm, I'm not sure about Andrew, but I know Rivka, her group was very close to Mamilla at that part of the parade. So they were able to take shelter under the mall, right? Uh, which is a very big space. Like it's a, it's a much, uh, if you have to be in a bomb shelter while Iron Dome is doing its thing, you may as well be somewhere that's spacious. Um, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah. You know, not to make light, but then you can go shopping afterwards. Right? I, kept, <laughs> I keep saying Eva because I was thinking it would be Eva's dream to be in a bomb shelter in uh, mm -hmm. the mall. Oh, uh, not Rivka so much. That Shelly, did you want to say something, Shelly? No, she's talking to somebody else. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, someone else wanted to say something. Was it was it Rini or Ruth? I saw. I, I heard somebody. Rabbi, yes. I have to leave now. I just wanted to thank you very much. Oh, I'm sure. Sorry. Thank you. Sure. We're, um, good luck. Let us know what happens thank when you leave. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. So we're about. I'm gonna, just wrapping. Going to wrap up the Matan Torah. It's kind of a big issue to wrap up with. Uh, it is. Called, uh, denominational difference. Before I move to the Book of Ruth, but let me share this with you. Uh, back to. Yeah, while you're looking at that, I was just thinking about because you mentioned at the end of Deuteronomy where it says Naseb and Nishma. Mm -hmm. That's always been a that's always been a a, 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 a a source of endless conversation of endless conversation because it sounds so odd to say Naseb and Nishma, you know, do and then and, and and then listen, what kind of seeming nonsense is that? Right. But I've always thought of I, I've always thought that it really wasn't nonsense because if you think about the role we play as parents, mm -hmm. like how isn't that exactly what we do with our with our children? We tell them what to do and what not to do when they're very young. Mm -hmm. And then when they get older and their minds mature, then we explain, explain to them to why we mind. told them to do mm -hmm. and not to do. Exactly. So isn't that, I've always sort of thought of that as paradigmatic for parenting. Interesting. Uh, by the way, the quote is not from Deut it's not from Deuteronomy. The Deuteronomy quote is the one about uh, God's right hand, esh dot lamo, mimi no esh dot lamo. Oh. The Naseven Ishma is in Parshat Mishpatim. It's in the book of Shemot, chapter 24, 7. Seven, seven, seven. Um, so the last big point, of uh, which we can't clearly discuss, but I just wanted to put out there in terms of asking the question, what happened at Sinai? Yes, we could look at gender differences. Yes, we could look at whether it was free will or whether B'nai Israel accepted the Torah willingly or even eagerly. Uh, but there's also the big question of denominational differences. And well, I'm not talking about man on the street or woman on the street who goes to a reform, conservative, orthodox, reconstructionist shul. I'm talking about the ideologies of the movements. Uh, clearly, we all may go to synagogues where we don't necessarily agree with the ideology. But there are very big denominational differences specifically regarding the ideology of what happened at Matan Torah. And specifically this question of revelation, what happened at Sinai, and we talk about uh, what happened. What do you mean what happened? The question what happened is also an issue of was it a supernatural event or was it not? Was it God speaking? Did God actually give something at Sinai? Or is this more a story that was told by people after the fact? And uh, the further to the right you are in the movement, so Orthodox and then followed by conservative and then Reconstructionist and Reform, the more you're going to say this was a supernatural event that God actually spoke at Sinai. And, uh, and what did God speak? God gave the oral Torah and the written Torah. And if God gave the oral Torah and the written Torah, then the oral Torah, the authority of it, of the Torah Shabel Pet, is very high. And uh, the source of the Torah's authority is from God, and the level of the Torah's authority is high, and the ease of halachic change is low. And then as you move further from the right to the left in the denomination, if you move from Orthodox to various shades of conservative to, uh, to the Reform movement, 
um, going all the way to the leftmost part of the reform movement, the more you would say in answer to A that what happened at Sinai was, well, something happened, not sure what it was. It might've been just a, you know, a very extreme weather day, lightning and thunder, and people saw this and they were moved and they came up with this story, which doesn't mean that it's not, doesn't, it's not meaningful for us. It's part of the sacred narrative of our tradition. And so we do honor it, we respect it, but the Torah Shebel Peh, the oral Torah, all of those commentaries were not given by God. The source of the Torah's authority primarily comes from human beings, which means that the level of the Torah's authority when it comes to Jewish law is low uh, or lower than it would be in, say, the conservative or the orthodox movements. And the ease of halachic change is um, easy, no problem. Um, the idea of halachad is being having more of a, uh, a vote, not a veto that we could learn Jewish law, but it's we really go by personal autonomy. That's how it as you get more to the left in the Jewish movements, that's uh, the easier halachic changes. So I wanted to at least share that with you. It's a, a whole class in and of itself, not only a single session, but like a college semester, we could talk about the difference in denominations, but I didn't want to leave the story of Matan Torah without uh, at least picking this up. So I'm going to now very abruptly shift to Ruth Lippmann's book, otherwise known as the Book of Ruth or Megillat Ruth. So if you have a, a Tanakh, uh, or if you want to go into Sepharia, okay, and I think you know. Yeah, I've, I've got, I've, I've got to run, but this was really just, just Thank great. You, so you're going to leave the women to talk about the women, to talk about. Well, women. you know, but, but listen, I was out, I was outnumbered for over an hour. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your comments, Ash. They're enlightening as always. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. I'm going to put Ruth up on the screen because I'm going to assume that you don't all have it. Uh, and if you have a different translation and want to share it, goes into hate. Okay, so Ruth, okay, let me switch my focus here. And I thought we would just do a, a, a close reading of, of the book of Ruth a little bit, uh, since oftentimes we talk about Ruth in generalities, but we don't talk about don't actually read it. So in the time we have, I want at the very least to do a close reading of chapter one and address some general issues. Uh, but let's start from the beginning. So Ruth, would you do us the honor of reading the first couple of verses of the book of Ruth? Um, you need to unmute. In the days when the chieftains ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah with his wife and two sons went to reside in the country of Moab. The man's name was, um, okay, <laughs> Emily Melch. His wife's name was Naomi and his two sons was, were Malon and Chilion, Ephrates of Bethlehem in Judah. They came to the country of Moab and remained there. Okay, so, so sorry you had to break your teeth on a whole bunch of <laughs> crazily transliterated words there. Uh, and I actually I'm going to share with you some commentaries on the significance of these names, because in the Tanakh, oftentimes the store, the names of people are very uh, telling, they foretell the future in some way, or they indicate uh, something thematic about the story and about these people. Uh, but before I do that, let's uh, go to the first uh, chapter, uh, this verse one. So we had just mentioned Moab, right? When I was telling, showing you with Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, and the Moabites were, they are descendants of Moab. Moab means Me'av. So the Moabites are not viewed very favorably in Jewish tradition, not only because they're the products of incest, but also uh, they, the Moabite women were considered to be seductresses who not only enticed the Israelite men to have sex with them, but also to be idol worshipers. And in fact, in the Torah, in a different part of the Torah, in the book of Devarim, there's very strong language against the Moabites saying that we should not let the Moabites into our midst. So the fact that in the very first verse, we're getting this a mention of Moab is ominous. Um, this other part here, Vayihi Bimei, in the days when, Vayihi Bimei Shvot HaShoftim, in the days when the chieftains ruled, also an ominous 
sounding beginning. Uh, there's in Midrash Root Rava, there is some commentary on is every time we say uh, you start a story with Vayahibi May, is it bad? Or is it sometimes good, sometimes bad? Here, clearly it's bad. Um, Shufot HaShoftim, the time of the judges, the chieftains, was a time of unrest in Israelite history. It was a time between uh, we had Shmuel, Samuel, the prophet, right before that we had Joshua. And before Joshua, there was Moses. And then after the Shoftim, there's the kings. Shoftim was this in-between period where there was no centralized authority and things were not great uh, uh, among the people. There, You'd have some chieftain who came and saved the day for a short period of time. And then things yeah. went south again. Vayihi uh, Ra'av Ba'aretz, there was a famine in the land. Never good when a story starts with famine. And in particular here, you have of Beit Lechem, house of bread. Okay, we see the word Bethlehem and we, we think of it as just a place name, but Bethlehem is actually the house of bread. And how ironic for a house of bread, Beit Lechem, to be a place of Rav, a place of famine. So already packed into this first verse, we have a lot of ominous hints that this is, the story is not going to start out as a happy one. And then in chapter, in verse two, chapter one that Ruth read with all these crazy names, uh, there is some significance to these names. So let me uh, find what I wanted to share with you on this. Okay. One second. Okay, somehow I can't pull it up on the screen, so I will just, uh, I'll just verbally tell it to you. Uh, so the name Elimelech means my God is king. Okay, that's nice. Okay, so nothing uh, bad about that. Some also say that Elimelech could refer to, unto, could mean unto me will come a king, meaning from me a king will be descended because, it you know, spoiler alert, is King David actually descends from this family tree. So that's a good thing. Okay, so where are the ominous, where are the bad sounds? Kilion. Okay, I'll put this back on, that I could put back on the screen. So these names, Machlon and Kilion. Not good names. Machlon comes from the word choli, which means sickness. Chole is sick. Beit Cholim is a house of sick people, otherwise known as a hospital. Uh, machlon could also, in addition to coming from the word chole, could come from the word uh, chol, like secular, which sometimes can also be translated as profane. Uh, so there's a, and another possibility of what machlon can come from is mache, macha, which means to erase. So whether you say that machlon comes from sickness, from profanity, blotting out, erasing, none of these are good words. So you want to be hearing right here in verse two of the book of Ruth, this dun, 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 something bad is going to happen, foreboding. Then you have the name Chilion, also a very negative name. Chilion could come from the word, uh, the, the word you may be familiar with is Vayahulu, from the Friday night service, Vayahu, also the Friday night Kiddush, Vayahulu Hashamayim Vaha'aretz, Vayahulu Hashamayim Vaha'aretz, Vayahulu Hashamayim Vaha'aretz means, and the, the heavens and the earth were completed. And then there was the seventh day, which was Shabbat. Kilion, because that's actually a very nice sentiment, but the Vayahulu word means it was finished. Okay, it was finished as in Ganuk, bad, done. Um, so Kilion, as a name of a person, means he is done. Uh, he will be destroyed. Uh, he will be eradicated. His work will be complete. So Machlon and Kilion uh, do not have very uh, positive names here. So combined with the fact that they come from uh, that they are marrying women who are from Moab, combined with the fact that their father, uh, Eli Melech, who's got was a very important man who has king and God in his name, he is someone who leaves the people instead of as a, uh, he, he doesn't stay in the place of Ra'av, he doesn't stay in the place of famine, he goes to Beit Lechem, to the house, uh, so he leaves Beit Lechem, the house of bread, and he goes to Moab. Okay, so um, let's keep reading. Uh, Elaine, would you like to read verse three and four? Ah. Okay, I have to unmute. Uh, oh, it, okay, 
Ellie Melloch, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. So already we've got bad news number one here. Yeah. Now, bad news number two and three, verse four. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth, and they lived here, they lived there for about 10 years. Okay, so I just want to say something about these names as well, Orpah and Ruth. Um, Orpah sounds and looks very much like Oprah, and I have heard a story, I'm not sure if it's an urban legend or if it's rooted in reality, that Oprah was named after Orpah, but they transposed the letters. I'm not sure if that's true. Someone can fact check for me. Uh, but what I can tell you about Orpah is that this word Oref means back of the neck. Uh, and when we, B'nai Israel, the Israelites are referred to as stiff-necked, stubborn people. The word is Am Kishay Oref. stiff neck means like you won't turn around, you won't compromise. Uh, you're turning your back on something. So Orpah is someone who her name connotes turning back, turning her back on something. We'll find out what in a little bit. And Ruth is a very positive name. Ruth, I'm sure Ruth Littman is happy to hear this. Uh, Ruth uh, comes, we could say it comes from the word reut, which means friendship, or it could come from the word ra'a, uh, resh alefhe, which means she saw, as in she was visionary, or she saw the wisdom of her mother-in-law. Um, it, another explanation of root is that the gematria, the Hebrew numerical equivalent of the word root is 606, which is um, the number of mitzvot that traditionally a non-Jew takes on when becoming a Jew and converting to Judaism, because all non-Jews are considered to be bound by the seven Noahide laws. And so in addition to the set, so when a non-Jew becomes a Jew, they're really taking on 606, so for a total of 613. And then the last really positive aspect of Ruth's name is that uh, Ruth is, when spelled backwards, is Tur, which is a turtle dove. And just as a turtle dove is considered to be as pure, uh, to be as fit for a korban on the Mizbeach, to be a sacrifice on the altar, so was Ruth fit for inclusion in among Jewish people in the assembly of God. So lots of uh, nice Ruth explanations, and I'm happy to go over those with you one-on-one, -on -one, Ruth, uh, in a separate venue if you want to write them down at some point, because it's always good to know the good aspects of your name. Right? Uh, okay, so Elaine, you were reading. Uh, let's, uh, Myrna, would you like to read, or Betty Ann? Myrna, want to read? Okay. okay. She started out with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for in the country of Moab, she had heard that the Lord had taken note of his people and given them food. Accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living, and they set out on the road to the land of Judah. Okay, keep going. But Naomi said to her daughter-in-laws, turn back, each of you, to your, her mother's house, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that each of you find security in the house of a husband. And she kissed them farewell. They broke into weeping and said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi replied, turn back, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I any more sons in my body who might be husbands for you? Turn back, my daughters, for I am too old to be married. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I were married tonight and I also bore sons. Should you wait for them to grow up? Should you on their account debar yourselves from marriage? Oh no, my daughters, my lot is far more bitter than yours, for the hand of the Lord has struck out against me. They broke into weeping again, and Arthur kissed her mother-in-law farewell, but Ruth clung to her. Okay, stop right there. So this Orpah kissing her mother-in-law farewell, that's where that Oref comes in, the back of her neck. She turned her back on her mother-in-law. She went back. Um, doesn't necessarily make her a bad person. It just makes her a very normal person. The average person in this situation would not go ahead to a foreign land with, the, with a mother-in-law when the husband's not even alive anymore. And so Ruth does, she goes above and beyond uh, what's considered, you know, she does, she does above normal um, and she clings to her. So with someone, actually, Ruth, why don't you read this, the big Ruth speech? Here. So she said, 
See, your sister-in-law has returned to her people and her gods. Go follow your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Okay, read that again. I think we had some noise in the background there. So if you could read that again, verse 16. Okay, but Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Keep going. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus and more may the Lord do me if anything but death parts me from you. Okay, very powerful, right? And you, many of you, I think, have heard this. Uh, I'll read it in Hebrew. She st Ruth starts by saying, Al tif ki'ivi le'ozvech, lashuv me'achareich, ki el asher telchi elech, uva asher talini alin, amech ami velohaich elohai, va asher tamuti amut, visham ekaver, ko yase Hashem li v'cho yosif, ki hamavet yafrid beni uvenech. Really powerful. I look at how in such strong words here in verse 16, she doesn't just say, I'm going with you, right? She could have just said, I'll go with you, but goes on to say, your people shall be my people, amech ami, and your God shall be my God, which is why so many of the commentaries on the book of Ruth, the rabbinic understanding of Ruth is that Ruth was the quintessential convert. Uh, although there's no description of a conversion ceremony here, by her making this statement, she's essentially making, throwing her lot in with the Jewish people. Uh, she, it's not just an issue of a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law who are friends and the daughter-in-law wants to help out. That's definitely a piece of it, but it goes beyond that. There's a, a bigger piece to it, which is she's throwing her lot in with Naomi's people and with Naomi's faith. Um, so we'll go on now. Okay, so verse 18, uh, somebody else like to read this? Uh, Bobby, would you like to read it? Uh, When Naomi saw how determined she was to go with her, she ceased to argue with her. And the two went on until they reached Beit Lechem. When they arrived in Beit Lechem, the whole city buzzed with excitement over them. The women said, can this be Naomi? Do not call me Naomi, she replied. Call me Mara, for Shaddai has made, made my lot very bitter. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. How can you call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me when Shaddai has brought misfortune upon me? Thus Naomi returned from the country of Moab. She returned with her daughter-in-law Ruth the Moabite and they arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, so that wraps up chapter one of the book of Ruth, and we'll, we'll go into some of the other chapters perhaps. But if you just had chapter one of the book of Ruth, uh, what might be some reasons that you might think that this is read on the holiday of Shavuot? Her acceptance of, of, of the law of God. Oh, yeah. yeah. No hesitation. Yeah, I mean, she's doing at the individual level what B'nai Israel essentially did on the group level at Sinai, what we just read about in Exodus 19. So that reason enough to read it on, on Shavuot, right? Um, in a sense, B'nai Israel were converts in the sense that they were accepting faith. They were, yes, they were, they may have been born Hebrews, born Israelites, but until they had that covenant at Sinai, they were not really part of the people. They were not part of this covenantal relationship. Okay, so that makes it very appropriate for Shavuot. The very last, uh, the very last verse that we read is another reason why this is read on Shavuot. Um, it's read on Shavuot because of the season. Oftentimes books of the Torah or Megillot or additional readings have to write, th certain pieces are seasonally appropriate. And this was the time of the barley harvest. And as you know, we're counting the Omer right now, right? It's a seven week counting 49 days between Pesach and Shavuot. So this is the time of the barley har harvest, okay? Um, let me think if there's anything else I wanted to mention. 
Okay, so there's some additional reasons why Ruth is read on Shavuot, but they come not from chapter one, they come from some of the later chapters. So let's go ahead and look at chapter two. Okay, Myrna, did you want to read? I can read. Now, Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a man of substance of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Okay, Boaz is another uh, very uh, significant name. The word Oz is strength. Ozi vizimra yava yahili li shua is uh, one of the lines in Shirat Hayam, the song of the sea, and it's about strength. So Boaz means in him is strength. Uh, in Arabic, I don't know if there's a connection here at all, but um, in Arabic, uh, Boaz could mean, uh, could be connected to the Arabic word bazun, which means to be swift. And then one other is it could be a transposition of a Hebrew word meaning to abandon or to desert. So that doesn't sound, I'm not sure how that would connect with the Boaz that we're introduced to, but that's just another commentary on that. Um, I also, I realized I forgot to mention something about Naomi. I mentioned the other names. Naomi means sweet, pleasant. Her deeds were sweet and pleasant. And she refers to herself at the end of chapter one as the very opposite of sweet and pleasant. And that is Mara. Mara means bitter. It comes from the same word as Maror, like bitter herbs. Okay, so keep going, Myrna. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, I would like to go to the fields and glean among the ears of grain behind someone who may show me kindness. Yes, daughter, go, she replied. And off she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. And as luck would have it, it was a piece of land belonging to Boaz. You have to scroll up. Who was of Ellie Malik's family. Uh, presently, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem. He greeted the reapers. The Lord be with you. And they responded, the Lord bless you. Boaz said to the servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose girl is that? The servant in charge of the reapers replied, she is a Moabite girl who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. She has been on her feet ever since she came this morning. She has rested but little in the hut. Boaz said to Ruth, listen to me, daughter. Don't go to glean in another field. Don't go elsewhere, but stay here close to my girls. Keep your eyes on the field they are reaping and follow them. I have ordered the men not to molest you. And when you are thirsty, go to the jars and drink some of the water that the men have drawn. Right. The, the word molest here, it does, molest. this is a translation here. I'm not sure if they're concer the concern that there actually was going to be sexual molestation here or that, that they were just going to harass her, bother her. Bother we're not really sure, but this is the, this is a translation. The world is levilti nog ech, that they don't touch you. It, you know, it could mean a lot of things, but the translator made a choice here. Okay, keep going. She prostrated herself with her face to the ground and said to him, why are you so kind as to single me out when I am a foreigner? Boaz said in reply, I have been told of all that you did for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband and how you left your father and mother in the land of your birth and came to a people you had not known before. May the Lord reward your deeds. May you have a full recompense from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wing you have sought refuge. She answered, you are most kind, my Lord, to comfort me and to speak gently to your maidservant, though I am not so much as one of your maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here and partake of the meal and dip your morsel in the vinegar. So she sat down beside the reaper. She handed her roasted grain and she ate her fill and had some left over. When she got up again to glean, Boaz gave orders to his workers you are not only to let her glean among the sheaves without interference, but you must pull some stalks out of the heaps and leave them for her to glean and not scold her. She gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley and carried it back with her to town. When her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and when she took out and gave her what she had left over after eating her fill, 
Yes, scroll up. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be he who took such generous notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law whom she had worked with saying, the name of the man with whom I worked today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who has not failed in his kindness to the living or to the dead. For Naomi explained to her daughter-in-law, the man is related to us. He is one of our redeeming kinsmen. Ruth the Moabite said, he even told me, stay close by my workers until all my harvest is finished. Scroll up. And Naomi answered her daughter-in-law, Ruth, it is best, daughter, that you go out with the girls and not be annoyed in some other field. So she stayed close to the maidservants of Boaz and gleaned until the barley harvest and the wheat harvest were finished. Then she stayed at home with her mother-in-law. Okay, so chapter two. Uh, anyone want to summarize it? And then I'll ask the question, what in chapter two might make us think that this is an appropriate reading for Shavuot? It's about the barley harvest. Okay, so like sh certainly just the, the setting itself is very much Shavuot time of year. It's the barley harvest. Uh, all three of the Regalim, all three of the pilgrimage festivals, they have a historical aspect to them, but they also have an agricultural aspect to them. So Sukkot, well, let's take the easiest one, Pesach. Okay, so Pesach, we think of the historical event of the leaving of Egypt. That's why we celebrate Passover, but it also was a wheat harvest. And then with Shavuot, we mostly think of it as the giving of the Torah, the holiday of Zman Matan Teratenu. That's true. That's the historical aspect, but the agricultural aspect, it was the barley harvest. Uh, one other additional piece is this whole chapter, um, it doesn't, it talks about the barley harvest, but it specifically is focused on acts of chesed. And the acts of chesed that are being per performed are by Boaz and also by Root. So what kind, what is Boaz doing that is filled with loving kindness? What is he doing that's so great? Well, isn't he fulfilling the um, commandment that you take care of the widow? Yes. Yes. So it's Sadaka in the general sense, but it's a specific form of Sadaka that you're taking care of widows. Uh, the people who are considered to be the most, uh, let's say, marginalized, but the ones least taken care of in society uh, in biblical times were the Ger, the Yatom, and the Amana, the convert or a stranger, uh, the uh, orphan, and the widow. Okay, so she, he's taken care of. There also is a, a biblical command, and specifically an agricultural form of tzedakah, that's known as leket, which is leaving stuff behind. Uh, and throughout Myrna's reading, the English uh, translation of the, of the word leket, uh, it was about gathering, collecting sheaves. There is a mitzvah called leket, which is dafka to let, you're supposed to, one of the ways in which you help a widow and other poor people and other needy people in society is not just by giving them handouts, but by you're doing your normal thing of you're doing your harvest and stuff falls out of your hand, let it fall. You know, that stuff is for is for people who are in need. Uh, another one of the agricultural mitzvot that's in the Torah, it's not mentioned in chapter two of the book of Ruth, but it's called peya, like the same word as peyas, like that Hasidic guys have. Uh, peya means corner. So they're called peyas because corners of your hair, corners of your head, but a pay of the corners of the field. That's uh, Janet Kaplan when she puts together uh, for us for Yom Kippur, the food drive uh, that when people bring food to, to shul on, before Kol Nidre, I think the name of the organization or the project is called Corners of the Field. It comes from this idea of peya, this mitzvah. So what does this have anything to do with, with Shavuot? Shavuot is a day, is a law giving day. It's a day that celebrates the giving of laws. Laws do not just include ritual laws. They also incl include interpersonal laws. And some of these laws are uh, ethical, moral laws, including acts of chesed, acts of loving kindness, including the specific acts of tzedakah, of leket, uh, and other agricultural giving to the needy that are addressed in chapter two. So that's uh, yet another reason why the Book of Ruth is read on Shavuot. Uh, let's go now to chapter three and four and see what that adds to our understanding of why this is a redeeming kinsman. 
Okay, that's a really great question. And let me find it first so I can show what you're talking about. Um, do you remember what verse is it in? At the top, go down, go down. Wait, in chapter three or verse two? In uh, chapter two. In chapter two, uh, one root. Uh, here we go, got it, got it. I didn't see it. And it's chapter two, verse 20, right? So in Hebrew is, uh, so the word goel, gaal, is, I, I didn't, I did a count once and I don't have it written here. I think it's something like 25 times in the next, we're going to see it not only in chapter two, but we're going to see it in chapter three as well. Specifically here, they're talking, there's an allusion to the law of the leveret marriage. So what is the law of the leveret marriage? It's when a woman and a man are married and the man dies before any children are born. The leveret marriage law requires that woman to marry the next of kin, ideally the brother. Uh, that would be so, but Machlon died and Kilion died, so there weren't any living brothers left. But Ruth is technically supposed to be marrying the next of kin. So here, when Naomi is talking in verse 20 of a redeeming kinsman, it's like he, Boaz, is one of the people who may fit this criteria of being a redeeming kinsman, of being able to fulfill the leveret marriage obligation uh, because of your deceased husband, my, my deceased son. Uh, but it comes from the word goel, which we see all over our religious texts in the Sidor in particular. We have Ga'al Yisrael. We refer to God as the one, as the redeemer, God who redeems us. Okay, thanks for pointing that out because it's a really good segue to chapter three because there's going to be a lot of stuff about this leveret marriage in here. Um, uh, okay. Um, actually, no, that's not going to be till chapter four. All right, but chapter three. So keep that in the back of your head, uh, Bobby and everybody else, and we'll get we'll be back to the leveret marriage later. Now let's go on to chapter three. Uh, who Rabbi, I'm sorry, before <laughs> I may have to click off again. Yeah. Because the nurse is here. But um, what was the number one reason for reading the book of Ruth on Shavuot? Um, well, it's not number one in terms of priority, uh, but uh, the one, the first one I mentioned that we mentioned in our discussion is about law, about, I th Bobby, do you want to say it again about the accepting of the Torah? Oh, well, she, she instantaneously accepts uh, uh, the Torah and uh, your God shall be my God. This is what Ruth says to Naomi as she follows her back home. Oh, like we accepted the Torah. Like we accepted the Torah. Thank you. Without question. Yes. Okay. And the second reason, if you're still listening, Elaine, I think that we mentioned was about the barley harvest. And then here in, in, in what we read so far in chapter two was about acts of chesed. And um, the acts of chesed, so Boaz performs acts of chesed for Ruth, but also Ruth practices acts of chesed for Naomi. We're going to see this in, continuing to unfold in chapter three, but we saw the beginnings of it in chapter two, because the whole reason Ruth is going out there to glean is not just for herself, but also for her mother-in-law. And God and B'nai Israel's relationship is very much characterized by chesed as well, by this uh, love, mutual love. Uh, okay, so now chapter three, chapter three. Uh, who would like to read this? Bobby, would you like to read? Oh, Naomi, her mother-in-law said to her, Daughter, I must seek a home for you where you may be happy. Now there is our kinsman Boaz, whose girls you were close to. He will be winnowing bar barley on the threshing floor tonight. So bathe yourself, so bathe, anoint yourself, dress up, and go to the threshing floor. But do not disclose yourself to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he lies down and go over and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what you want to do. Sounds pretty she busy. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> she replied, I will do everything you tell me. She went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. Boaz ate, drank, and in a cheerful mood went to lie down beside the grain pile. Then she went over stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, the man gave a start and pulled back. There was a woman lying at his feet. It's getting very hot and steamy here. Um, I think when I taught this class, this on uh, Wild Women a few years ago, 
I pointed out how the word vatigal margalotav, uh, yes, it can be translated as regel, meaning leg, but margalit is a jewel, a precious jewel. And so it could be translated instead as that she didn't uncover his feet, she uncovered his crown jewels, so to speak. Um, so it was a little bit more racy of a scene than meets the eye. Keep going. In the middle of the night, the man gave a start and pulled back. There was a woman lying at his feet. Right. I had you read that again because I wanted to show you the Hebrew, Vayihi Bachatzi Halayla. We have that in our Passover Haggadah. So the, the amazing story of Geula, the quintessential story of Geula, of redemption, redemption from Egypt. When we're telling it at our Passover Seders in the Haggadah, we recall the verse from the Torah that says, Vayihi Bachatzi Halayla in the book of Exodus, where it says that it was in the middle of the night that that 10th plague happened. It was in the middle of the night that the exodus from Egypt occurred. Um, it was after, as God was going, as the, the angel was going from house to house, enacting the 10th plague, Makat Bechorot, the slaying of the firstborn, that's when Pharaoh finally changed his mind and said, okay, you can go. So Vayihi Bachatzi Halayla, it was in the middle of the night, when we see these words in the book of Ruth, where we're sensing now positive, just how the book of one, the chapter one gave us some foreboding hints just by the names of the people. Here, by this phrase, by Yehiba Chatzi Halayla, we're getting a sense that Geula, redemption, is at hand. Okay, so keep going, Bobby. Who are you, he asked, and she replied, I am your handmaid, Ruth. Spread your robe over your handmaid, for you are a redeeming kinsman. Yep, there we go. And there's that word, Goel, you are a Goel. Keep going. He exclaimed, be blessed of the Lord, daughter. Your latest deed of loyalty is greater than the first in that you have not turned to younger men, whether poor or rich. And, for, and now, daughter, have no fear. I will do in your behalf whatever you ask, for all the elders of my town know what a fine woman you are. But while it is true I am a redeeming kinsman, there is another redeemer closer than I. Stay, stay for the night, then in the morning, if he will act as a redeemer, good, let him redeem. But if he does not want to act as redeemer for you, I will do so myself as the Lord lives, lie down unto the morning. And here we go with the shoes, yes? Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. So she lay at his feet until dawn, she rose before one person could distinguish another, for he thought, let it not be known that the woman came to the thrashing floor. He's careful about her reputation. And he said, hold out the shawl you are wearing. She held it while he measured out six measures of barley, and he put it on her back when she got back to the town. When she, oh, excuse me, when she got back to the town, she came to her mother-in-law, who asked, how is it with you, daughter? She told her all the man had done for her, and she added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying to me, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And Naomi said, stay here, daughter, till you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Okay, so you have this continuing the act of chesed here, um, and you have to say, not only is Boaz doing chesed for Ruth, Ruth is doing lots of chesed for Naomi. I mean, just the fact that she put herself in this uh, compromising position at the threshing floor, that alone, um, she gets uh, some kind of points for that. Uh, and we're getting the sense that positive things are gonna come out of this connection. Uh, and now chapter four. So who'd like to read, Ruth, what do you wanna read our, the final chapter of the book of Ruth? And we'll see how it all ends up. It's a happily ever after story, <laughs> okay. Meanwhile, Boaz had gone to the gate and sat down. And now the redeemer whom Boaz had mentioned passed by. He called, come over and sit down here, so-and-so. And he came over and sat down. Then Boaz took 10 elders of the town and said, be seated here. And they sat down. He said to the redeemer, Naomi, now returned from the country of Moab, must sell the piece of land which belonged to our kinsmen. Elimela, I thought I should disclose the matter to you and say, acquire it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you are willing to redeem it, redeem. 
but if you will not redeem, tell me that I may know. For there is no one to redeem but you and I come at you and I come after you. I am willing to redeem it, he replied. Okay, just in that one verse alone, that word redeem, right? Um, I'm just going to show you in the Hebrew, right? He says, uh, okay. uh, and then we have here, and egal. So it's all these words that are connected to redemption, redeemer. So clearly there's something about this theme of redemption that's very important. Uh, keep going. I am willing to redeem it, he replied. Boaz continued. When you acquire the property from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabite, you must also acquire the wife of the deceased so as to perpetuate the name of the deceased upon the estate. But that's the Leverett marriage reference. Okay. The Redeemer replied, Then I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own estate. You take over my right of redemption, for I am unable to exercise it. Now, this was formally done in Israel in cases of redemption or exchange. To validate any transaction, one man would take off his sandal and hand it to the other. Such was the practice in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, Acquire for yourself, he drew off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders, to the rest of the people, You are witness today that I am acquiring from Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that belong to Chilion and Mahon. I am also acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malon, as my wife, so as to perpetuate the name of the deceased upon his estate, that the name of the deceased may not disappear from among his kinsmen and from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses today. All of the people at the gate and the elders answered, We are. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house, like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built up the house of Israel, prosper in Ephraim, and perpetuate your name in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar born to Judah. Oh, we studied that. Yes. So the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So okay, but wait, before we read the you read the last verses here, let me just show you the family tree here. Um, give me a second. Okay, here's a family tree. And this, um, as we've pointed out, we've studied this before. So if you look all the way at the, t uh, the top of this family tree, you've got here Avram, Avraham and Sarah. They have Yishmael. Okay, so now let's go over to Lot. Who was Lot? Lot was Avraham's nephew. I mentioned before that Lot had these two daughters that slept with him after the destruction of stone. They had these two children, uh, Moab and Ben-Ami or Ammon. The Ammonites come from Ben Ami, also known as Amon, and the other one comes from Moab. And then if we go down all the way, uh, dot, 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 coming from Moab, that's where Ruth comes. Okay. But on the male side of the equation, so Ruth marries Boaz, uh, what is, here we have Boaz's lineage. Okay. So Boaz's father's, uh, uh, Boaz's father's name was Salmon. Salmon's father was Nachshon. Nachshon was Aminadav, Aminadav's father was Ram, then Chetzron, then Perez. Perez, or Peretz in Hebrew, Peretz and Zerach were the twin sons born to Tamar and Judah. And as Ruth pointed out, we that's Genesis, uh, we studied that before, it's Genesis 38, it's Parshat Vayeshev. That was also a leveret marriage. That also involved a bed trick of sorts, right? Tamar she pretends to be a prostitute so she can sleep with her father-in-law judah which sounds icky but what she's doing is trying to fulfill have him fulfill the leveret marriage obligation because tamar had been married to Er, and he died then she was married to onan and he died and then she was supposed to be married to shelach to fulfill the leveret marriage obligation but judah didn't want his third son to come anywhere near tamar so he pretends it i'll wait till he gets older and then i'll let you marry him and we'll do the leveret marriage thing, but he never does, which is why Tamar tricks Judah 
and why Tamar um, eventually ends up getting pregnant. Uh, and when Judah finds out that his daughter-in-law is pregnant, he doesn't realize she's pregnant from him. She thinks he's, he thinks she's done something wrong and, and slept with somebody who, and, and, was, and it's considered adultery because she's engaged to Shelah. So Tamar ends up giving birth to these twins, Peretz and Zerach. And it's from Peretz that we follow this line and we end up with Boaz. And now I will let Ruth finish up the book of Ruth and you'll see all these names uh, come again. So Boaz married Ruth. She became his wife and he cohabited with her. The Lord let her conceive and she bore a son. And the woman said to Naomi, the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not withheld a redeemer from you today. May his name be perpetuated in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain your old age. For he is born of your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the child and held it to her bosom. She became its foster mother. And the woman, the women neighbors gave him a name, saying, A son is born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, father of David. This is the line of Perez. Perez begot Herzon. Herzon begot Ram. Ram begot Amiadab. Amiadab begot Nishan. Nishan begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David. And that's how the book of Ruth ends, which is crazy, um, because we have all that like action packed, right? And so, right, so Bobby saying, I could read Bobby's lips. What happened to Ruth, right? So um, it becomes very close. So a couple of points to make. First of all, uh, that word goel, I did find my count here. The word the words that come from the word from the root goel, gimel aleph lamed, are twenty three times in chapter three and chapter four of the book of Ruth. And the underlying idea there, I, I think, is that the connection between Ruth and Boaz is the means by which God is brought back into the universe and by means by which B'nai Yisrael are redeemed. And so this theme of redemption is very much part of the book of Ruth and it's also part of our Shavuot story. Uh, so it, it may be, it's a, it's a stretch, but that's another Shavuot connection. Yet another Shavuot connection is that this is a story that ultimately ends with the genealogy, which means that that's like, in some sense, the whole point of the story. It's almost not about Ruth. Um, it's somehow about David. And it's a story of fulfilling legal obligations, and which reflects the legal nature of the Brit, the covenant between God and B'nai Israel at Sinai, and also the recurrent theme of Brit covenant throughout the Torah. Uh, but if you're searching for yet another reason why this may be read on Shavuot, um, according to rabbinic tradition, King David, um, it, who was a descendant of Ruth, through that whole line that our Ruth Lippman just read, uh, he died on Shavuot, according to rabbinic tradition. So if you take that reason with all the others I gave, you have at least half a dozen reasons why Root is a fitting book to read on Shavuot. Um, so I will, was not planning to, I was planning to leave you with that, but because we are all women now, we, uh, we lost our token male. Uh, <laughs> I am going to end with something that is more female centered um, to share with you. And as another takeaway, not connected with Shavuot per se, uh, but there was a time that I taught the book of Ruth once to a bunch of uh, congregants at a church in the Philadelphia area, and uh, this is one of the materials that I used with them. So I wanted to share this with you. So when I taught this uh, to the Christian women from the Methodist church, it was actually two different churches. It was a United Church of Christ and also... Um, a Method, the United Methodist Church, and we used a book called Seasons of Friendship, Naomi and Ruth as a Pattern by Marjorie Zoet Bankson. And um, according to the, her, Marjorie Zoet Bankson's take on the book of Ruth is that each chapter represents a different uh, aspect of friendship. Uh, so mm -hmm. Ruth, chapter one that we read, was considered to be 
I'm not sure how clear this is. Um, I'll read it. Uh, Ruth 1, the first, uh, is a prequel. Uh, spring, the season of we, the season of birth, growth, new experiences. This is when Naomi and Ali Mella get married and have children, and Naomi befriends uh, other young moms. Then in Ruth, that's before Ruth, before Ruth. Then Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 is the summer, the season of I, the season of change and searching and hungering and redefinition. This is when Naomi and her family leave during the famine and move to Moab. In verses 3 and 4 of the book of Ruth, this is when Naomi tries to integrate into the Moabite community after the death of her spouse, Elimelech. And so Bankson refers to this section of the book of Ruth as autumn, the season of us, of integration, of gathering. Then chapter one continues, verses five through 18. Bankson points to the crisis of Naomi's son's death and Naomi journeying back to Bethlehem with Ruth. And she refers to this section of the book as the season of me, winter, finding myself in solitude, leaving the familiar. And then the last section of, of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two is the season that Bankson refers to as spring, being new together. This is where Naomi and Ruth start a new life in Bethlehem with Ruth providing food for Naomi. Then um, we go ahead, that's through, that takes us all the way through chapter two. Chapter three, uh, all of it, is Banks and refers to as the season of friendship of summer, searching for call and identity. It's when Naomi mothers Ruth and encourages her to unite with Boaz. Then chapter four, we, we go from autumn to winter to spring, all in this final chapter. Autumn is when Naomi has this vision and for Boaz and Ruth to be together and to do the whole redeeming kinsman thing. Uh, Ruth's place in the community in Bethlehem among the Jewish people is confirmed. So that's autumn entering community. And later on in the chapter, verses 13 through 16, this is um, the, these crises of marriage and motherhood, uh, Ruth's relationship to Naomi changes. And there's a role reversal now between Ruth and Naomi. Ruth now mothers Naomi um, um, and all of that. Uh, winter, sharing myself. And then Ruth, chapter four, the last part of that fourth chapter, at the very end of the book of Ruth, Bankson sees this as spring, birthing a new life. This is when Ruth and Naomi each play a role in birthing and mothering Ovid. And then Ruth and Naomi integrate their uh, their friendship roles of independence, dependence, and interdependence. And the women of in Bethlehem help to interpret the value of Ruth and Naomi's experiences. And at that point, Ruth and Naomi recognize the continuity of the past, which enables them to hope for the future. And um, so what I wrote down here, this is a quote directly from the book, from Banks's book, we have different types of friendship in each season. The seasons continue to cycle by in a spiraling path repeating the process and renewing us each time, building on the discoveries and relationships from the previous season. The spiral never stops. Like seasons rolling toward each equinox, we find ourselves anew with friends, rebirthing God again. So I thought that would be something you may have not seen before connected to the book of Ruth. And I took us from the particular of the book of Ruth and how it's connected to Shavuot and the Jewish people to um, some universal messages uh, that you might find interesting as well, as women in particular. Uh, Rabbi? Yes. 